and God bless all of you. I'm happy to be here tonight um, once more to share God's words with all of us. I hope that we all had a wonderful day today. Mine was a little hectic, but God brought me through and clearly he has done the same for you too. So we can say praise the Lord. Amen. 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 Well, last week, well, the series that we are studying is on Revelation chapter 13. But like I said last week, the book of Daniel is pivotal in understanding the book of Revelation and other end time prophecies. So it is important for us to examine um, the book of Daniel, particularly two chapters um, that will help us to accept and understand a better or to get a better understanding of Revelation chapter 13. And so tonight we will um, be going through again another book of Revelation of um, Daniel. But before we go to Daniel, I want to remind us of what our focus is really on Revelation 13. And I just want to bring back your memory, or if you have your Bibles, you could turn to Revelation 13 so we can refresh ourselves as to what we're trying to find out. And so Revelation 13, as it begins, it says the dragon stood on the shore of the sea and I saw a beast coming out of the sea. It had 10 horns and seven heads with 10 crowns on its horns and on each head a blasphemous name. The beast I saw resembled a leopard but had feet like those of a bear and the mouth like that of a lion. The dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority. So we can stop there for now, just to remind you of exactly what our focus is on. It's on this beast coming out of the sea, clearly a dreadful beast. It had 10 horns, seven heads with 10 crowns on its horns and on each head a blasphemous name. So the beast, and take note here now, I saw resembled a leopard, but it had feet like those of a bear and a mouth like that that of a lion. So John here in his vision saw this terrible beast. It resembled a leopard, it had feet, feet of a bear and mouth like a lion. So the big question is what could this be? But as we said last week, we studied prophecies for particular reason, not just to, not just to, um, to get familiar with, with, with the, the names, with history and, um, and the names of past kings and emperors and, and, um, and what will happen in the last days as we're living, no. But we study prophecy to find hope for ourselves as children of God. And like I emphasized last week, in all that we'll be studying, I want us to focus on the hope that lies 
in these prophecies for us. Because the Bible says, if it were in this life only, we have hope of all men, we will be most miserable. So serving God, we want to know that what lies ahead and that the life that we have must offer something more than what we are experiencing now. And these prophecies will open our eyes and give us hope to what lies um, ahead for us. And so we study prophecy to reassure us that the word of God is trustworthy, that the word of God is reliable and divinely inspired. Prophecies also serve as time markers. So while we're serving God, living for him, doing his work, we also want to know where we are. Amen. So prophecies serve as time markers, point us to the future and their fulfillment and reinforce hope in the promises of God. And that is what is important. And I want also, since we're looking at prophecy, to look at Isaiah chapter 46, verses 9 and 10, to see what God has to say about his words. And I'll read it for you. Isaiah 46, 9 to 10, it says, Remember the former things, those of long ago. I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. I say my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. This is the word of the Lord. So at this point we say, Lord, there is none like thee. There is none like unto the God that we serve. I am God, he says, and there is none like me. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. I say my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. This is the God that we serve, brethren, and this is the God that we are going to find out more about. So, as I said before, the book of Daniel is pivotal in our understanding of the book of Revelation. Last week, we looked at the dream, the vision of Nebuchadnezzar. And we may recall that Nebuchadnezzar, he dreamt of a statue, the statue of a man. And it had, it was divided up into four parts, gold, silver, chest of silver, thigh of bronze, and feet of iron and clay. Daniel interpreted that vision for him and showed him that the image that he saw, that statue of a man that he saw, represented four kingdoms that shall rule the world. And like we said last week, the Bible interpreted itself. So the first kingdom that was established, according to Daniel 2, was the kingdom of Babylon, led by Nebuchadnezzar. Then we have the Medes and the Persian. Then we have the Grecian kingdom. And finally, the Roman kingdom that is in existence up to this time that we are living. 
And we noticed also in Nebuchadnezzar's vision that Daniel was curious, very curious, and he showed a lot. He wanted to find out more about the fourth kingdom. He was interested in that. And last week we went into details as to some of the things that will happen during this fourth kingdom. Well, that was Nebuchadnezzar's dream that Daniel interpreted. Tonight, we're going to look at Daniel's own dream that God gave to him. And so if Sister Jackie is kind enough, as she has always been, she could read for us Daniel chapter 7. And um, while she prepares herself, let us remember what we looked at in Revelation 13 about this beast that John saw that looked like a leopard and had parts of a bear and a lion and, um, and so on. As I said, these visions, these chapters are pivotal. It will help us so much better to understand um, Revelation chapter 13. So let's hear um, you know, Daniel's own dream. Sister Jackie. Okay, I begin. Sure. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heavens strove upon the great sea. And the four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked and it was lifted up from the earth and men stand upon their feet as a man and a man's heart was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second like to a bear and it raised up itself on one side and it had three ribs in the mouth of it between the teeth of it. And they said thus unto it, arise, devour much flesh. After this I beheld, and lo, another, like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke in pieces, and stamped the residue with the feet of it and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it. And it had 10 horns. I considered the horns and behold, there came up among them another little horn before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of man and a mouth speaking great things. I beheld till the thrones were cast down and the ancient of days did sit whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were opened. I beheld then, because of the voice of the great words, which the horn spake, I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As concerning the rest of the beasts, they had the dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and time. I saw in the night visions and behold, one like the son of man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the ancient of days and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. I, Daniel, was gripped in my spirit in the midst of my body and the visions of my head troubled me. 
I came near unto one of them that stood by and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made me know the interpretation of the things. These great beasts, which are four, are four kings, which shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron and his nails of brass, which devoured, breaking pieces, and stamped the residue with his feet. And of the ten horns that were in his head, and of the other which came up, and before whom three fell, even of that horn that had eyes, and a mouth that spake great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. I beheld, and the same one made war with the saints, and prevailed against them. Until the Ancient of Days came, and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High, and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down and break it into pieces. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall rise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. And they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. But the judgment shall sit, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and to destroy it unto the end. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Verse 28. Hither too is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my cogitations much troubled me, and my countenance changed in me, but I kept the matter in my heart. Thank you, Sister Jackie. You're welcome. Very interesting reading we see there. But like I said, in all the things that we were listening to a while ago, I want us to look for the hope that is in there for us. Verse 26 says, but the court shall be seated and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it forever. Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the most high. Let us praise the name of the Lord. Yeah. And this is what we will call a glorious hope. Amen. And I just want to read it again for emphasis, brethren, because like I said before, life should have much more meaning than what we are experiencing here now. Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people. And Daniel went on to describe who are these people? The saints, the saints of the most high. His kingdom and his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all dominions shall serve and obey him. So we're looking for a better land, a better place to live where God himself will be our ruler. And that is the hope that we have. All right, so with that in mind, we can examine the chapter now. 
Um, like I said, last week we look at Daniel chapter 2. This week we'll, we're looking at Daniel chapter 7. Then next week, now we'll really get into the meat of the matter. So um, asking for the patience of everyone here. Um, on week three, we will get to Revelation 13. But we must um, um, study Daniel in order to understand what's over there in Revelation 13. As a matter of fact, by the time we're done tonight, when we get to Revelation next week, we're going to realize how it all comes together. So anyone here would like to just give us a summary of chapter seven, just as a synopsis? A brief um, summary. Anybody? Anyone care to do so? Someone has to, you know, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> You're muted, Pastor, right? Um, I would want to try... Um, just a brief summary, just what you recall. Um, a brief summary of Daniel um, 7 for me is that Daniel um, has a vision um, and he, uh, for a foretell, you know, event, mm -hmm. um, you know, of a future. And so he, in a vision, he saw four beasts um, that um, represent, you know, kings, you know, that will rule the herd. Um, Daniel also said in his vision that the fourth beast, you know, will triumph um, over, over nations on, on the herd. The horn of the fourth beast will represent um, a ruler. So here we see that he will try to oppose. And, and I think one of the greatest um, op opposing that he will be you know, involved in is to oppose the people of God of their faith in, in, in him. You know, wanted them to surrender to him and, and bow to his, his, his you know, ways. So um, he will be a, a ruler to oppose, you know, and to persecute, as I said, you know, those who follow the Lord. But eventually, God eternal kingdom will establish, as you said, teacher. Amen. Thank you so much. No, I can always count on you. And um, this brings me to the point now where I say that we do accommodate questions. So as we, before we end, that an opportunity will be given to you to ask your questions. Um, we may not have have all the answers prepared to give you tonight, but this program is a program of standard and quality, right, Pastor Corey? Right, so we will- Definitely, sir. Right, so we will, if you ask us a question that we're not able to answer tonight, we will do a research and we will return um, the following week with an answer and like I said last week, if I'm not able to answer it, thank God, Pastor Corey. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So we um so so feel free, brethren. We are here to all learn um, together. And remember that God uses his prophets to provide his children with comfort, instructions, correction, and guidance. God uses his prophet and prophecy to unlock mysteries about God and his plan for us and the world we live in. To discover that the Bible predicts accurately the rise and fall of nations right. and that one day God will establish his kingdom here on earth. And we notice that in, in Nebuchadnezzar's dream in Daniel chapter two, it ended with the kingdom of God being established on earth. 
And here with Daniel's own vision, it too ended with God establishing his kingdom on earth. And I say again, praise the Lord for the hope that we Amen. have if we remain faithful to live not only through the hardships and the troubles and the trials in this life, but we'll get an opportunity to live with the Lord forevermore. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. So Daniel, in his um, dream, he saw a raging sea. And he saw also four beasts that arose from the sea, one by one. And I, I, I want us to open our imagination and just imagine we were Daniel having this dream. Well, maybe we'll be, we'll be thinking that we're having a serious nightmare. The first he saw was a, a lion. Well, well, before I go on, Daniel was, was very troubled when we read the scriptures after he, um, he woke up from his dream. He was very troubled. So first he saw a lion. What was the next beast that he saw, next animal? A bear. A bear. And the third? A leopard. I'm trying to encourage a little interaction here. A leopard. A, a leopard. four edged leopard. Thank you very much. And anyone like to attempt to describe the fourth beast? A dreadful and frightening monster. <laughs> dreadful and terrible. Dreadful and terrible. Any other description? Description. Yeah. Doesn't give a specific. Pardon? Oh, I was just saying, unlike the, the previous three, so yeah. we were told specifically a lion, a bear, a leopard, this it's one right. was indescribable. Exactly. Like, like it's not a specific animal. And this is the one that we need to focus on. Oh my gosh. The one that we cannot describe. What on earth has Pastor Corey put me into? That great thing in <laughs> All right, so the first, a lion. The second, a bear. And we notice the bear came up on one side first. And then the third, a four-headed leopard. So, Look, just, just flash back now to Revelation 13. And um, anyone would like to outline if there's any similarities that, you're, that is beginning to emerge here now. Can you repeat the question? No, I, was, I, I, said, I would like us to flash back, just look back at what we read in Revelation 13 compared to Daniel 7? And do you see any similarities emerging here? Do we realize that all these beasts have the same characteristic of the beast in Revelation 13? Yes. Thank you. And, um, I I would say maybe maybe um, based on my finding, teacher, mm -hmm. maybe I I probably go in too far too quick, but um, this beast would have represent the triple six because um, six um, is 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 the number of of the devil. Mm -hmm. And so, um, six, the first one is six. Which, which, one of these? which one of the beasts are you referring to? The third one. Third. He will he will carry the, the triple six. Because the third one, the leopard? 
yes. Okay. Because he'll be more dreadful than the, the other two. So it, that's why he triple up to be triple six, because he will be more dreadful, you know, determined, putting on more pressure um, than the other two gone one. Okay. Thank you very much. I see. Is that Sister Marcia? Yes, it is. Well, I'm, yes, sir. I'm, Jack, I'm not sure which hand was up first. Maybe yeah, so Sister Gooden first and then Pastor Lang. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay, maybe I should wait to hear what Pastor Lang has to say. But I just wanted to say, in my, it's, I'm not taking it from my head, I'm taking it from my notes, right? Yes. Just so you know. Um, but it's saying that for Daniel's dream, like the first, um beast mm -hmm. would represent would represent um something that that Nebuchadnezzar saw so it is like a representation of Nebuchadnezzar himself in his kingdom right and the beard then would represent Medan and Persia and its reign and what comes next the leopard, leopard. so it represents probably that kingdom but when we come to the undescribable beast. Now it is like Rome and whatever is happening in our end time. Right. Yeah, I just yes. wanted to say that. Yes, excellent point you have made there, Sister Bill. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Pastor Lee. Yeah, good night, everyone. Good night. The, yeah, this John's beast Actually, as was stated, it has characteristics of all the beasts that Daniel saw in his vision, which means that elements from all the previous empires would be present in this beast. It's very interesting also that if the head beast and the horns in the four bees combined, you yeah. actually get the same number of heads. Okay. And this or of where well, I'm yeah, we're looking at we're looking at a beast. Well, well I've, I've, I didn't get parts of what you said you dropped out a little so if you could go back a few lines oh now you're saying that i said this beast actually has characteristics or features from all the beasts that you find in daniel's vision right the so it does it takes every it takes elements from babylon from media persia from greece and we know based on the characteristics that it has seven heads and 10 horns, that it has to be more representative of the Roman Empire because it has the seven heads and the 10 horns from the Roman Empire. Thank you very much. So it is, it is very interesting. I know. Yeah. <clears throat> interesting indeed okay interesting indeed right so this beast um the, the fourth that the fourth beast as you all have correctly said hard to describe undescribable one one person said is a terrible creature with great iron teeth out of the head of the fourth beast arose seven heads and 10 horns. But also interesting to note, and we're going to spend a little time on this tonight, is the part that said, and then a little horn appeared that uprooted three horns. So I want us to, to bear that in mind as well. 
So, but before we go on any further, have we identified the seven heads and 10 horns? Well, the first beast, because we need to make note of this, as Pastor Lynn said, very important, the seven heads and 10 horns. The first, a lion, and that is one head. The second beast, a bear, that's another head. So we are at two heads. And the third beast had how many heads? How many heads the third beast had? Four heads. Four heads. So we, 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 we have jumped to six heads. And then the fourth beast, that's the seven heads. And the fourth beast has also 10 horns. So we have, we have seen the seven heads and the 10 horns. Make note of that because we're going to need it when we get to Revelation 13. And like I said, we have the little horn that came up that we're going to look at in a little while. And like in Daniel 2, um, as I've said before, this vision also ended with God establishing his kingdom. So let us allow the Bible again to interpret itself. So we read about the beast and the horns and what must be going through our minds as we have um, alluded to earlier in, in, um, while we're speaking, but we want to allow the Bible to interpret itself. So Sister Jackie, could you read? Daniel chapter 7 for me and verse 17, verse 23, and verse um, 24, because we want the Bible to interpret itself. Okay. Mm -hmm. So verse 17. Yes. These great beasts, which are four, are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. Verse 23. Verse 23. Thus he said, sorry. Yes. Verse 23 and 24. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. And the 10 horns out of this kingdom are 10 kings that shall arise and another shall rise after them and he shall be diverse from the first and he shall subdue three kings. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So we read about these beasts coming out of the sea. And while we're reading, if we're not, if we have not, if we're not familiar with, um, with the scriptures, this particular scripture, then what is going to come in our minds is what do, what is the meaning of um, these beasts? No. The Bible interprets itself and it tells us that the beast represent kings or kingdoms. And so the lion would represent the first kingdom. I remember the, the in, in um, we're going to see that the Daniel 2, the vision in Daniel 2. And this vision in Daniel 7 represent the same events. So let's do a comparison now. In Daniel 7, that's where we are. The first beast is the lion. So that would be equivalent to the head of gold that we read about in Daniel chapter two. Chapter two yeah. are, you, are you following me? Yes. Right. Because remember we said earlier that Nebuchadnezzar got his dream and no Daniel um, got his dream and both dreams are referring to the same events um, clearly. So the head of gold on the statue is equivalent to the lion in Daniel's dream. 
So let us follow now. So the chest of silver, the Medes and Persian will represent which kingdom? In Daniel's, in that, which represent which animal? Which, the which bear. Animal? The, the bear. bear. Right. And the thighs of brass on the statue would represent which animal? Leopard. The leopard. The four-headed leopard. leopard. And then the two legs of iron and clay on the statue would be equivalent to the the fourth the beast. Fourth beast. The terrible, terrible beast with seven heads and ten horns, like the feet has ten toes. Mm -hmm. so all these little things are significant that we should bear in mind. All right. Mm -hmm. So we see all the animals except one has four heads. No, anyone would like to tell us why this animal has four, is represented with four heads, the leopard. Why is the leopard represented with four heads? I think, I think um, four probably generals or different person rule within that period of time that they were ruling. Thank you, Sister Gooden. You're right on track. Anyone else? Thank you, Sister Good. Well, according to history, and we're answering the question now, why four heads? According to history, the records show that at the death, so remember that the, the third animal, the leopard, represent the Grecian kingdom led by Alexander the Great. And according to history, after his death, four of his generals, took over. In other words, the Grecian empire was divided among four of his generals. So Alexander died and the Grecian empire was now split into four. That is why um, um, Daniel saw the four heads. All right, so we're moving on because the kingdom of the lion has passed, well, so to speak, because when you get to Revelation 13, you're going to maybe ask him, is it really gone? The kingdom of the bear has passed, so to speak, and the kingdom of this four-headed leopard has passed so to speak. Now, Daniel wanted to know more about the fourth beast, the fourth kingdom. And we established last week that the fourth kingdom, and we are saying it tonight again for emphasis, that the fourth kingdom represented the, represent the, the fourth beast represents the kingdom of Rome or the Roman Empire. So let's look at Daniel 7, 19 to 23, if Sister Jack would be kind enough to read for us so we can um, hear what Daniel has like Daniel 7, 19 to 23. Go on, Jack. Okay, so Daniel 7, 19 through 23 reads. Yes. Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron and his nails of brass, which devoured, breaking pieces and stamped the residue with his feet. Of the 10 horns that were in his head and of the other which came up and before whom three fell, even of that horn, that had eyes and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them, until the ancient of days came, and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High, 
and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. Thank you, Sister Jackie. So here Daniel said, then I wish to know the truth about the fourth beast. And throughout these studies, that is what we too will discover, the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the other beasts, exceeding dreadful with teeth of iron and its nails of bronze, which devoured broken pieces and trampled the residue with his feet and the 10 horns that were on his head and the other horn which came up before which three fell, namely that horn which had eyes and a mouth which spoke pompous words, whose appearance was greater than his fellows. And I was watching and the same horn was making war against who? Who was that horn making war against brethren? The saints. Making war against the saints until the ancient of days came and judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High. And like I've been emphasizing, let us look for the hope within these prophecies. Let us look for the hope. Because this horn will make war against the saints, will persecute the saints. But in the midst of the persecution, who will appear? The ancient of days. So brethren, we will be delivered. Jesus himself said it, that for the elect's sake, the days shall be shortened. Let us praise the name of the Lord. Praise God. Hallelujah. We will be persecuted. We will suffer in this life. But here is hope, brethren, that in the midst of our persecution, the ancient of days will step in and rescue us. And that is the hope that I have. God, the hope that I want all of us to have and that we should... Um, we should continue to persevere patiently because God is going to deliver us. Amen. And so the vision refers to the time of the end. Mm -hmm. Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 are parallel prophecies mm -hmm. pointing to the same period of time. Do we agree with that? Mm -hmm. So let me repeat, the vision refers to the time of the end. Number two, Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 are parallel prophecies pointing to the same period of time. And so the focus is on this fourth beast, this terrible beast that we we cannot, um, um, we find difficult to describe. And that is what we read of in Revelation 13. But we also noticed a very interesting um, part of Revelation of um, Daniel 7. And I want us to zoom into that for a moment. And that is the little horn. Do you remember what we read about the little horn? Daniel 7 and verse 8. Let me read it for you again, just for emphasis. I was considering the horns. So remember horns, as, we, as the Bible interpreted itself, means kings. I was considering the horns and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots and there and there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and the mouth speaking pompous words 
And so what does this mean? Does it have any meaning to me as a child of God? Does it have any meaning to you all as children of God? Verse 24. The 10 horns are 10 kings who shall arise from this kingdom, which is the fourth kingdom. So from this fourth kingdom, the kingdom of Rome. So remember, we're dealing now with the Roman Empire. Out of the Roman Empire, 10 kings shall arise from this kingdom and another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the first ones. So another question that we need to put in the back of our, our, our mind is, why is this king different from the first ones? What makes him different? Bear that question in mind. And he shall subdue three kings. He shall speak pompous words. And I want us to make note of that, that as well. Against the most high. And this is what we need to bear in mind also. He shall persecute the saints. He shall persecute the saints of the Most High and shall intend to change times and law. I want us to make note of that also because we want to, we're going to, we need to know what is the meaning of all of this. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. What on earth? does this mean? And after that, 26 down, then it's going to be judgment. Judgment for this beast. So, apart from the 10 horns, another horn shall rise up. And remember we read that this horn is going to persecute the saints. I remember um, in one of our recent study, um, there's a line that says that when Christ calls us, in the, I think in the introduction to the lesson there about, he calls us to die, <laughs> not to die but to die, come and die. I think it was something like that that it says, come and die. Because this horn, as we read, one of its duty is to persecute the saints. It shall uproot three horns or three kings. It shall speak pompous words against the most high. It, it shall intend to change times and laws. The saints shall be given into his hands for a time, times, and half a time. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the list goes on. So the little horn, so we're going to be discussing a little history. Because even though I've been emphasizing that the Bible interprets itself, we also need the help of history to confirm indeed that the word of God is true. So therefore history and prophecy goes hand in hand because God would have spoken it, history would have confirmed it. Amen. So this little horn shall uproot three kings. So we want to try to find out now who is this little horn. And who are these kings that were uprooted? With the marks? Yes. 
Would you be able to take a question from Pastor Marshall? Um, certainly. Okay. I don't like talking alone for too long. <laughs> Go ahead, Pastor Marshall. Unmute yourself, please. Praise the Lord. 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 Praise God. I, I, I just came in. I don't know how far, but I am listening. But as the question asked, about these kings or uh, kingdom, and these that were three kings were the Vandal, the Astrogoth, and the early. And and this king here, and as you refer to a, a year and a year and a half, and year and a, and, and a, a year and a year and year and a half, that limited time that is given. And this man of sin that uh, rise up against. If you remember that Daniel also said that the ten kingdoms, and you have already where three of them rooted up, and so they have them named, and they have where this it referred that a stone shall you know out of the mountain and shall smite this this beast at his feet, and all his kingdom and all shall be crushed and divided. And so you you are doing well as I heard, but I, I just want to say as you ask, who is these kings? And I, I want to know that kings and our kingdom, and it was the Astrograd and the early and the Vandal. Thank you so much, Pastor Marshall. We can always rely on you to back us up. But we're going to get there. And uh, interestingly, I heard you mention the man of sin. We're going to get there. But remember now, we have Revelation um, 13, which we are studying. But we, for those who may just be joining, the focus is on Revelation 13, the two beasts of Revelation 13. But in order to understand the two, the two beasts of Revelation 13, Daniel, the book of Daniel has the key. So what we're doing now, we're using the key to open the door to Revelation 13. Understand? So be patient. We'll soon get there. All right. So I'm focusing for a moment on the little horn because it is this little horn that affects us most, especially those of us who are living in the last and closing days. And what we see happening in the world now, there's absolutely no question whether or not we're living in the last and closing days. But thanks be to God, we read about the ancient of days who will step in in time to rescue us. Right, so the we're going to look at the first three horns or the first three kings that were uprooted by this little horn. Now, according to history, in the year 286 AD, the Roman Empire was divided in two. So we remember the, the two legs that we read about in Nebuchadnezzar's vision in Daniel 2. You all remember that. So the two legs represent a divided Roman Empire. And according to history, oh my that took place, that took place in 286 AD. And it was divided in two for administrative purposes. Right? So the empire, remember, we read, you know, oh. Oh, oh, this beast was different from all the rest. It was mighty and it had iron teeth and it breaking pieces and, and smashed up everything. This, this, this fourth beast was like a, a monster. So the fourth empire, the Roman empire expanded vastly, grew bigger than the other empires. And so no, it, it, um, it could not manage with just one um, administration. So 
in 286 AD, they decide that they're going to divide the empire in two. And so it was divided into the Eastern leg and the Western leg, just as Daniel saw that image with two legs. You remember what we read in Isaiah 46, nine and, and verse, um, Isaiah 46, verse nine and 10? that God speaks, see, and that his words accomplish what he pleases. Well, he said that the fourth kingdom would be divided in two and it happened in AD 266. The Roman empire was divided in two for administrative purposes. However, remember we also read in, um, in Daniel, two with that vision that as iron and clay can't mix then these kingdoms will not be united and so that was 286 AD by, by AD 400 according to history the western leg started to deteriorate by the year 409, Roman, Rome itself was looted and destroyed. Now, this is a date that I want us to bear in mind also. The year 476 AD, by, it is accepted by theologians as the fall of the Roman Empire. Because this year marks, the year 476 AD marks the year when the last Roman emperor was killed and his name was Romulus Augustus. And when we get to Revelation 13, because I have to keep mentioning this, um, when we get to Re Revelation 13, we read now about how, how the beast receive a deadly wound to the head. So in 476 AD is the accepted year of the fall of the Roman Empire and it is marked by the murder of the last Roman Empire. So that's the deadly wound um, according to the scriptures. So after this last Roman Empire was killed, and remember now, we're talking about the Western leg. The Eastern leg of the, of the Roman Empire remained intact, but the Western leg, like I said before, continue to deteriorate. And the entire em empire continue to deteriorate just as God um, um, predicted, or just as God said. So subsequently after the death of Romulus, Augustus, three groups, and as Pastor Marshall rightly said, the Vandals, the Heruli, and the Ostrogoths sought to establish themselves as successors to the Roman Empire of the West. So, the, um, so get the picture now, the empire the empire, Romulus Augustus is dead. And then three kings sought to establish themselves to replace him. Are you all following? Yes, sir, sure. Right. Mm -hmm. And so in order to, because the Western, um, the Western leg of the Roman Empire, as I said, was intact, and they want the entire empire to be intact. So when the first group came up and established themselves as leaders, then the empire in the West would recognize each of them as a continuation of the legitimate Roman Empire in the West. But while they were governing, so remember we're talking about the, you know, the three 
horns that were plucked up, the three kings that were plucked up. So these three kings established themselves. And remember the names? The Goops, the Vandals, the Heruli, and the Ostrogoths. But while they were governing, while they were governing, another ruler in the West emerged. So remember now what we read in Daniel 7, that, in, that Daniel saw a little horn that arose and it was different from the others and it uprooted three horns. So while these three groups with their king was presiding, this little horn came up and overthrew them the three kings, or if we prefer, the three arms. And who is this? Um, who, who is it, this man or this other little king that emerged, that uprooted these three kings? We are going to be looking at that now. That little arm. This emerging leader, my brothers and sisters, was the Bishop of Rome. The Bishop of Rome, as always, and still is today, we're going to realize that, exercised power, not only over the Christian community, but over civil and political power as well. So the Bishop of Rome was both religious and political. And just to jump a little to the future here because we're familiar with the, the Vatican, the Vatican City that is nestled in the city of Rome. The Vatican City is the world's smallest sovereign territory headed by, well, they're not called the Bishop of Rome anymore, but they're now called popes, headed by the Pope. And the Vatican maintained its own diplomatic relations with all major powers of the world. So the major powers, the major countries of the world in other words, would send diplomats to the Vatican, just as we send diplomats to other countries and diplomats from other countries come to Jamaica and to Canada and wherever in the world you are. It is the same way that these diplomats go also to the Vatican City. So, so this little horn, as we will discover, has both religious and political power. The Vatican is a full participant in international affairs. And we're going to get back to this, but I need to, to jump to it so that we can understand um, exactly where we're going. It will, it will once again achieve the guiding role it played for many centuries. And we're going to talk about like the alliance of church and state. So getting back to where we were talking about those three kings that were uprooted, the bishop, this bishop of Rome, as he was called then, was not happy with these three kings that emerged to replace the Roman Empire of the West. He was not happy because they were all seen as threat, not necessarily to the political unity of Rome, but threat to the religious unity of Rome or the Roman Empire. Why were they a threat to the religious unity of the Roman Empire because they were not 
Orthodox Catholics. They belong to a religious group that is referred to as Arians or Arianism. So they do not believe in the Trinity as the Catholic, um, as the Catholic does. They, the Arians, they do not believe that Christ coexisted with God, for example. They believe that he came about um, just since he was born um, um, through Mary. So the Catholics um, did not like this. They didn't want their belief to penetrate. So this little horn, because these groups now were causing the disunity in the, um, the religious disunity. He sought the aid of the Eastern emperor to get rid of them. And so one by one, but you see, the, the fourth beast is really terrible. And in Revelation, we read about mystery Babylon because what the empire of the what the empire of the of the east did was to use each group to fight against the other so the vandals were there the bishop was not happy with them because their doctrine their teaching was different and they want the the, 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 the unity of the doctrine, so they use the, 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 the empire of the, at the, at the behest of, the, of this little horn, the Bishop of Rome used the, the, the empire of the East, used you know, the, her, her rule to uproot the Vandals. And then he used the Ostrogoths to uproot the her rule and so on. And so this little horn, as we will discover when we get to Revelation, and as Pastor Marshall mentioned in 2 Thessalonians, we will see that this little horn is a religious power. And so these groups, they became unpopular. Each of them became unpopular. And as they become unpopular, the bishop asks that they be removed. And so they would have wars and they would be uprooted, just as God says. And so the three horns were plucked up by the behest of the bishop of Rome, the little horn in the Roman Empire. And so as each of them were plucked up over a period of time, this now sets the stage for the revival of the Roman Empire in the West. And um, as we see in Revelation 13, when we get there, we're going to see that the beasts that received a deadly wound, how he was, it was resurrected or came back to life. So after the last of the third king was uprooted, like I said, it set the stage now for the revival of the Roman Empire. So remember now, um, that 476 AD, that date that I asked you to remember when the last Roman Empire was killed, assassinated, then it, that was seen as the deadly wound. And uh, we read of the seven heads and the 10 horns these 10 horns all represent the revival 
of the Roman Empire. And what we have just discussed a while ago is the first three horns that were plucked up. All right. So all revivals, all subsequent revivals of the empire involve the blessing of the bishop of Rome or the Pope. We see this as the continuation of the ancient Roman Empire. Now we, we hear about the alliance of church and state because it's all going to come together when we look at the beast from the earth in Revelation 13. Now, there's what we call the, what is called, according to history, the imperial restoration. Now, what is the imperial restoration? In 554 AD, Justinian, the empire of the eastern leg of the Roman Empire issued a decree requiring that fit and proper persons able to administer the local government be chosen as governors of the provinces by, and listen by who know, be chosen as governors by the bishops and the chief persons of each province. So the Roman Empire, he made a decree. And this decree says that fit and proper persons to serve as governors are to be chosen by the bishop or the pope. So you see it coming together now, this alliance between the church and the state. Hence, the mystery beast that we're studying about carries both religious power and political power as well religious power and political influence. Now, this has implication for us, brethren. Whenever we see this coming together, it's dangerous. Because the, as, we, as I've demonstrated before, because the Bishop of Rome was unhappy with the Arian or the teaching of Arianism, he got rid of those people. And he got support. The church now got the support from the politicians or from political power. So this has implication for us because we are going to discover that the, the, that, that beast in, in Revelation 13, that beast from the earth is a beast with religious power. And we're going to discover also that the beast from the sea is a political power. And we're going to see also that the beast from the earth has all the authority that the first beast from the from the sea had. So therefore, when we get to Revelation, we're going to see truly how this political power and how this religious power come together and the implications that it will have for us. Now the question is, if in the past, this religious power was unhappy with another religious group, which was also a Christian group. 
but they were unhappy with the, that religious group because they were causing um, problem with the religious unity of the empire. No, the empire is going to be revived. And critical to the revival of this empire is unity, is religious unity, not only political unity, but religious unity as well. And that, I remember we read that this little horn will persecute who? The saints of God. So we think we're going through rough times now. It's even going to be rougher. They did it before. They are going to do it again. So this little horn, it speaks, we read also in Daniel 7, if someone could maybe find a verse for me, let me see if I find it, that this little horn spoke pompous words. It, yes, from verse 25, he shall speak pompous words against the Most High. It shall persecute the saints of the Most High and shall intend to change times and law. Teacher? Yes. Um, before you take the scripture, there's a hand I don't, can, I don't know if you want to take it now or after. Sure, yes, I'm so glad for that hand. <laughs> Get a break. You can go ahead, Pastor. Uh, blessings, blessings, sir. Yes, I just want to take a step back to see if I can get some clarity on what you said concerning the coming together of church and state under Justinian 538 AD. My question is, uh, what happened to the years prior to that where we have the Edict of Constantine 321, the enforcement of Sunday worship 364, so uh, what was that in terms of church and state and that um, persecution that was taking place? Well, thank you for your question. Constantine was in the third century. It was Justinian and um, not Constantine who made the decree that the church should choose fit and proper persons. So that is the point I was really um, making. The decree that was made for the church to choose fit and proper persons were chosen strictly by um, a political process, um, so to speak. But the church you now, was given um, in 550, it is 554 is the date I think I quoted, um, 554 that Justinian made, actually put it into law that uh, made a decree that this, um, that this should be done. So they may have been, um, the church may have been involved before because Justinian himself um, turned, um, so to speak, a theologian as well but um, the decree was not made according to the history that I'm familiar with until 554. I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, that's all right, you can go on. Thank you. All right, so any other question? Or are we doing a time, Pastor Corey? All right, so we, we close at 10 and it's, um, I have uh, 17 minutes to 10. Okay. It should be 17 minutes um, to nine in your country. That's right. Thank you very much. Right, so to pick up from, from, from where I left off. And just to, to reiterate that 
the church and the, and the state at this point came together to choose governors for the provinces. Now, I was going on to the point where um, describing the little horn and some of the things that he did. Verse 25 of Daniel 7, he shall speak pompous words against the Most High. Or blasphemy or boastful words. And for example, Jesus, for example, referred to, to God, his father, his father as Holy Father. You know, the Bishop of Rome or the Pope is referred to as most holy father or vicar of Christ. In other words, they claim that they are Christ representative here on earth. That's blasphemy. Jesus said that we should not call any man father on earth, except our own biological father, of course. But they have, they have taken these titles unto themselves. And just as Daniel said, pompous words. The Catholics, and, and, and they have claimed, and it's not hidden anywhere, that they have moved the sanctity of the Sabbath from Saturday, the seventh day of the week, to Sunday, the first day of the week. Didn't we just read that this little horn will intend to change times and laws? And I'm using those as example. Also, it said that this little horn shall persecute the saints of the Most High throughout the ages. Excuse me. Throughout the ages, many saints have been martyred for Christ, killed by the sword, burnt at the stake. We should have no doubt that these things will come to pass again because we are, we are living in the last days. Remember, Daniel described four beasts that represent four kingdoms. Three have already passed. We're now living in the fourth. And we're now looking at some of the things that will happen during the fourth kingdom and some of the things that will happen, that will that will take place, that will cause to happen by this little horn that um, arose and uprooted three other horns. But we have hope because in the midst of all of this, God will establish his kingdom. And I want to go back to verse 13, where Daniel said, as I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven, he came to the Ancient of Days and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and the kingdom that 
all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion and his everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed and so brethren we have seen here we have just described to the best of our ability what God intends for us. We looked at what was spoken of in the days of whole. And we are also now looking at what to come. Next week, we will be looking at Revelation 13, where we will look at more current events and what it means for us as Christians. Yes. What, we have, what we have done for the past, from last week and this week, is to get an understanding of what Revelation 13 is all about. This beast, this four in one beast or one in four, whatever way we want to describe it and what it represents. Daniel prophesied some 700 years before John. And yet we see the coming together of both visions and what they mean. We have laid the foundation to interpret our subject for this series, the beast of Revelation 13, the beast from the sea and the beast from the earth. We'll realize that Daniel also saw what John saw. And as the scripture said, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every mouth be established. I want to give a little time now for any question that we may have. I'm not able to look in the chat. I'm not sure if there are any questions there. Or if anyone would um, have any other question that they would like to ask. We don't have any in the chat. Okay. Do we have any question? Are we clear now? Not so the, clear. Not so clear. Sister yeah. Street here, Gail. Okay, I yeah. just want to refer you um, saying the little horn. Um, how many little horns were there? One little horn that uprooted three arms. Ten horns and then one. Ten horns, which represent ten kings, which are the which represent ten kings of the fourth kingdom. And then a little horn came up and uprooted three of of those. So we looked and we did look at the first three that were uprooted. So um so the, the prophecy with Antioch Epiphany, was, was he one of the, the horn that comes up, the little horn? That's a good question. My presentation is based on my understanding of the prophecy. Um, I have, I have, seen other interpretation that relates um, Antiochus Epiphanes to the little horn. But if we say that he is the little horn, then we 
when we get to Revelation um, 13, we may also run into a little problem there. Because what I've noticed is that those who interpret this little horn in Daniel 7 as Antiochus Epiphanes, um, they do not make any relationship between the vision of Daniel and the vision of um, John. So would you like to share your thoughts and on what you just mentioned? Oh, um, no, my thought is that there were two horns and um, two horns. Uh, a lot of times in there are... Um, pardon me? In Daniel 7? Yeah, in Daniel 8 and verse 9. Oh, remember, remember all focuses on Daniel 7. I was referring to Daniel 7. Okay. But you can share. Feel free to share. We're here to all learn. No, uh, no I, I thought you, um, you make a distinction with those two horns because um, people tend to say the horn, the horn, the little horn, the little horn. And there are two little horns, one that came up first and the other one that came up higher than the other one. So the little, the, the, chapter the eight. Little, you're, you're talking about chapter eight. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, that's yeah, uh, chapter eight. I was talking like, oh, okay. like, um, just to make, go ahead. Focus is on chapter seven. All but, right, because I came on late because mm -hmm. we have, we have, we have Bible studies also in right. Toronto. Right. Yeah. So um, I just um, log on to Ottawa. Mm -hmm. So I, I thought, as you say, the horn and the little horn, um, there's a difference between the little horn and the little horn. Yeah, we went. So you're talking about, yeah. you're talking about um, Daniel 7, the yeah, little Daniel, horn. We're talking about the little horn in Daniel 7. Okay, thank you. So are we singing from the same hymnal now? <laughs> <laughs> Are we I gotta... <laughs> yes, Are... yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. At another time in another study, we can look at Daniel 8. But our, our, um, our study in this series is really in Revelation 13. Okay. But if we just read Revelation 13 and interpret it by itself, we may find it extremely difficult and in the process we may leave some people behind right pastor quarry do you agree with me definitely sir right so we thought that it is important to lay a foundation for the understanding of revelation 13 and daniel as we have been saying holds the key to um, understanding Revelation 13. And for your benefit and for the benefit of those who may have joined a little late, that Revelation 13 is about the fourth kingdom. Remember now, Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar saw four kingdoms. Daniel saw four kingdoms as well. John's vision in Revelation 13 looks at one kingdom, the fourth kingdom. However, it has um, parts of all the other kingdoms, starting with Babylon. So last week, were you here last week? No, it's the first I log on. Um... You know, because as I said, we had um we had Bible studies in Toronto here um, yes. at Rexdale. So I just log off the Bible study there and try to catch this. Right. So um, I just log on about yeah, what, what we've been doing is laying the foundation for Revelation 13. So last week we looked at, at Daniel chapter two. And um and, and what that, that the vision of the statue represented. But what okay. we said, that was Nebuchadnezzar's vision 
that Daniel interpreted. In Daniel 7, Daniel got his own vision with the interpretation, and we realize that they are referring to the same events. And the, because Daniel saw four beasts, the lion, the bear, the leopard, and another one that we all have been struggling to describe all night. And, um, and when we get to Revelation 13, we will see that John saw this beast with part of it is a lion, part yeah. is a bear, part yeah. is a leopard, and so on. And it also has 10, um, seven heads and 10 horns. And that is what we have been looking at. So um, we thought how important it is to lay this foundation in understanding um, Revelation 13. So that is all we have been doing, basically okay. laying the foundation. And we are going to, um, and, and so we will look, we will get to the meat, so to speak, of the matter next week. But I spent a little time um, on a little history as to when the kingdom was divided. That's the kingdom of Rome, the fourth kingdom because that's the one we need to focus on when it was divided and why it was divided. We, we looked at also when the, the Roman Empire fell or the year that theologians accept as the, as the year of the fall of the Roman Empire, the murder of the last Roman Empire of the West, Romulus Augustus. And we looked also that after his death, three groups arose or three kings arose, which would represent um, the first three of the 10 kings, the first three horns of the 10 horns. And um, we went um, in a little detail to show how these horns were uprooted and by whom who uprooted them and why they were uprooted. They were uprooted but for religious reasons. And then we also looked at after they were uprooted by the Bishop of Rome now um, called the Pope, then um, the Pope was given um, tremendous power to um, to select you no know, governors, um, a decree was made and the Pope was given um, powers to select governors um, to rule the provinces. And, um, and, and when we get to Revelation 13, we're going to, to see again that beast from the earth and um, we're going to see how the link is made. And then we also, as we spoke of the Bishop of Rome and the, and the, and the now called the Popes, we also looked at the Vatican City since we are moving into modern times now, the, the, the Vatican City establishing the city of Rome is one of the world's smallest sovereign territory. Now remember this is headed by the by, by the Pope, a religious leader. And this, and Vatican City has dip diplomatic ties with all the major um, political influencers in the world. And we are going to look and, um, at the implications this have Christians. Many wars have been fought before. Many um, Christians have died and their death was a result of religious influence. So we need to look at the implication it has for us as Christians because we are looking at the economic hardships that we are experiencing now. And we're saying that we cannot bear this any longer. Well, brethren, 
These are the days that the Bible says call for patient endurance. And I want us to walk away with this tonight, patient endurance, because what we're, what we're experiencing now is terrible and it's going to get worse economically. But when the religious persecution starts, then it is even going to get worse. So the purpose for these studies is to help us, to prepare us to meet the Lord Jesus when he comes. We read of the ancient of days and how he will step in and establish his kingdom right here on earth. And that kingdom, my brethren, will not be given to any other but to the saints. I don't know about you, but I am looking forward to that day when the saints go marching in. I don't know if you still sing that song in church, but it's still a meaningful song. Oh, when the saints go marching in, oh Lord, I want to be in that number. And that is what Daniel is, and, that, and that's what I like about these prophecies. They give us hope that regardless of what is happening, the ancient of days, the king of glory will step in and we will live in peace forever with him. If we have no more questions or comments. This is where I say good night and thanks for your participation. Thanks for your kind listening. And next week, we go into the meat of the matter. Do we know the song, The Ancient of Days? I don't know it. Remember oh, it's Oh, Ancient of Days. Yes. You want Mr. Man Kirk. Power, glory and honor be unto the Ancient of Days. All of creation, da, 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 da. Bow before the Asian of days. Anybody has the words? <laughs> it's a great way to go out tonight. Anybody has the words? Or can find the words for <laughs> the street? <laughs> no. Sing every tongue in heaven and earth. Yes, go. Sister Quarry. <laughs> your glory, every knee shall bow at your throne. And worship you will be exalted, O oh God. And your kingdom shall not pass away, O oh, ancient of days. Thank you, Sister Quarry. <laughs> right there is our hope. Your and that is what. Your kingdom shall reign over all the earth. Sing to the ancient of days, and none shall compare to your much less words. Sing to the ancient of days. Every tongue in heaven and earth shall declare your glory. Every knee shall bow at your throne. And worship you will be exalted, O oh God. And your kingdom shall not pass away, O oh, ancient of days. Let us, let us praise Glory the name of God. Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Yes, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. That's why I said from the beginning, I don't want to get hooked up on the dates, but get hooked up on the events. And the most important event to be hooked up on is the coming of the ancient of days. Oh, ancient of days. And I want to leave us with night brethren because if it was in this life only we have hope of all we are most we are most deserve. we're going to be kings and priests and the ancient of days will hand over to us the kingdom and we will live and reign with him God. 
forever. Let us praise the name of the Lord. So praise, praise the Lord. Lord. Praise praise the Lord. Lord. Praise praise Lord. Lord. And regardless of what we will go through later, because we are going to be persecuted, no doubt about that. But in the midst of the persecution, we have hope. Job Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Job said, I know that in my flesh I will see my Redeemer. Abraham had hope. Amen. Amen. He looked for a, a better place. Amen. A place with foundation whose builder and maker is God. And so with all that we have gone through tonight, remember the last part of the vision where the ancient of days will step in and we will reign with him. Praise God. God bless you, brethren. Next week, we go to Revelation. <laughs>